Bible study in March of 1985, a white man barged into an African-American church in southeast Georgia, named the Rising Daughter Baptist Church. He cruelly shot a kind-hearted couple whose only crime was walking to the door. A couple so beloved in the community that the police couldn't even find a motive. The couple was simply attending Bible study with 10 other people that day, and none that were there had seen the man before. When he barged in, the man simply said, I want to speak to him, pointing at Harold. Harold Swan was 66 and retired, and he served as the church deacon. The two men started to struggle, and his wife, Thelma, 63, went over to try to help her husband. Moments later, the Swans were laying dead on the floor, shot by the man who had entered. Investigators had numerous tips, but they weren't able to identify a killer at all. It was thought, perhaps, to be a failed robbery. At one point, it was suggested it could have been a paid hit. The robbery theory seemed unlikely, as there was still $300 in Harold's wallet. The case sadly went cold until years later when Eric Spurray's wife came to the police force to say that her ex-husband had admitted to killing the couple. She was able to produce an audio tape where Eric admitted that he killed them. He said, I'm the mother that killed those two n in that church. The ex-wife going on to say that Spurray was a white supremacist and he bragged about the killings a lot after he tried to kill her in order to keep her silence about his abuse. The police interviewed Spurray, who lived in the rural county of Brantley, with his elderly mother and denied he killed anyone, saying it wasn't him on the tape. He eventually admitted it was him on the recording, but said it was only said to scare his wife. He didn't actually mean it. She had further proof, however. It was reported in the news that there was a pair of beat-up glasses found in the church behind the dead couple. Spare had glasses much like the ones that were described, and they went missing. They provided her with a lineup of different beat-up glasses, and she identified the pair from the crime scene as belonging to Spare. In crime scene photographs, the glasses are seen only inches from the Swain's bodies. A GBI agent called a number that he'd obtained for Winn-Dixie, where Spare was believed to be working the night of the murders, to check out his alibi. A man who claimed to be Spare's boss told the agent he would dig up Spare's time cards and call him back. The boss, listed in the detective's files as Donald A. Mobley, called back a few weeks later and said Spare had worked his job as a stalker overnight, from the afternoon to the morning after the murders. The glasses in question did have some hairs attached, but this was prior to DNA being frequently used so the hairs stuck to the glasses weren't tested at this time. The two original investigators on the case would eventually retire, with the case still cold. In 1998, the sheriff's office hired a man named Dale Bundy, who was a former deputy. His only job was to work the Swain murder case. He promptly began re-interviewing witnesses. Another possible suspect was a man named Dennis Perry. They re-interviewed a woman named Jane Beaver, the mother of Perry's ex-girlfriend, that he had asked Swain for money and that Swain had laughed at him. She said as a result, Perry told her he was going to get him back and kill him in retribution. It's not clear, but I don't think her story was new. Dennis Perry was questioned before. It was just dismissed when it was clear his alibi was airtight. Yet for some reason, Bundy seemed to develop tunnel vision regarding Dennis Perry. Jane Beaver had called in the tip before, so interviewing Dennis Perry wasn't new. However, he had an ironclad alibi that his boss vouched for. He wasn't even in the same town. He was at a work site 260 miles away with his boss. It would have been impossible for him to make it to the Rising Daughter by 8.45 p.m. that night. Even so, the original investigators still put together a photo spread with the faces of Perry at the time. They showed it to the witnesses that were there and saw the gunmen. No one recognized him. Yet based on Jane Beaver's claim this time, Bundy went with GBI agent Ron Rhodes to Florida to interview Perry where he was living now with his wife. Rhodes had been brought in to help Bundy. Rhodes regularly recorded interviews and always had a recorder with him. Yet for some reason this one time, the only recording of what was said between Perry was written down by Rhodes himself. He claimed that Perry said he could have been at the church he couldn't remember. And when he asked if the gun went off by accident, Perry said yes. Perry, for his part, denies this was ever said. Bundy was famous for never taking notes on anything related to the investigation. Later at trial, this would be pointed out by the defense and referred to as the Bundy method. Perry and his attorneys maintained that Rhodes' report is inaccurate and misleading. They pointed out how odd it was that this is the one time he didn't record anything, and if he had, it would be clear what Perry said and what the detectives had said to him. Unfortunately, Perry's trial lawyer, Dale Westling, would say, We'll never know what was said at the interview because three experienced police officers in the center of law enforcement in the giant city of Jacksonville, surrounded by electronic equipment, chose not to record it. They arrested Perry, and Jane Beaver became the star witness at Perry's trial in 2003. Afterwards, some jurors cited her testimony as playing the critical role in their decision. 
What the jurors did not know, however, was that Jane Beaver would get $12,000 in reward money for her testimony, a disclosure that only came later. The DA's case file, in fact, showed that Jane Beaver asked for her reward money exactly one day after Perry's arrest. Officials never disclosed that she was paid to the jury. In fact, they denied that she was after being approached after the fact. However, in 2018, the Georgia Innocence Project discovered a document proving that Beaver did, in fact, receive the money. They also had a statement with a note saying that Beaver suffered from delusions, hallucinations, and paranoia. It was also noted that they had tried to obtain her mental health records, but a judge declined to release them. There was never any information disclosed to Perry that someone else had actually confessed to the murder, or that the eyeglasses found next to the body were identified as belonging to Sparre, the man who confessed. So the jury heard none of this. In fact, the eyeglasses in the church weren't included at all in the case against Perry. Their very existence was ignored. It turns out they eventually tested the DNA on the glasses, but the DNA didn't match Perry, so the prosecution dismissed it as being irrelevant and unrelated to the case, even though they had previously verified the glasses as belonging to no one in the church that night, and they were found right next to the bodies. They did not test that DNA against any other possible suspects. The two initial lead investigators on the case believe this is the state's mistake. Former Sheriff's Deputy Butch Kennedy and a former GBI agent, Joe Gregory, both have long believed that Perry was innocent and should never have been arrested. In fact, both the original detectives testified for the defense at the trial to say they had cleared Perry in 1988 by speaking with his boss and showing a photo to the lineup of the church witnesses. The Innocence Project, in a related podcast, decided to dig into Sparay's alibi. What they discovered was that the detectives talked to somebody who was supposed to be his employer, but the man of that name doesn't exist. They never bothered to verify they were speaking to Sparay's boss or not. While they did ask for his date of birth and social security number and home and work numbers, all of it was fake. They did not belong to anybody named Mobley. And the man who managed the business at the time was named David Mobley, not Donald Mobley. And he never spoke to the police about Sparry at all. He also said he never had an employee named Donald Mobley either. It was at this time the Innocence Project wanted access to the confession that Sparry made to his ex-wife. However, the cassette recording went mysteriously missing. Eventually, Sperry's mother decided to help out, and she gave the police some of her DNA to test against the DNA in the eyeglasses. I imagine this was not an easy thing for her to decide to do. Sure enough, the DNA results proved that the hairs in the glasses belonged to someone closely related to Sparay's mother. Those that took Sparay's alibi at face value were just as quick to dismiss Perry's solid alibi. They also knew that the DNA didn't belong to him, so they chose to dismiss that also right along with the confession made by Sparre. And they were also fine with paying someone to testify that they clearly believed was mentally ill. Dennis Perry has since been released from prison. Gladys Sparre, 79, was later found dead inside her home in Winesville, Georgia, just hours after Perry's conviction was overturned. According to the last GBI statement, her autopsy hasn't offered a cause of death yet, even though quite a few months have passed since. Eric Sparre has so far never been charged with a crime. This is actually the third case that I've covered where police suppressed evidence and or paid the star witness and DNA exonerated them. There will be links below in the description if anyone is interested. The cases are Leah Freeman and Donna Meager. In Donna's case, it's alleged that a witness was paid and the DNA from the scene belonged to neither of the men convicted. In Leah's case, the DNA was found by the crime lab and they lied under oath about the existence of the DNA when the Innocence Project in that case found it, they found that it did not belong to Nick McGuffin, the man who was doing time for murdering his girlfriend. Innocence Projects in both Oregon and Montana got the men freed. It's not hard to wonder how many innocent people are doing time for crimes that they did not commit. That is horrible enough. But the problem that is even worse is when prosecutors and police bend the information to get the conclusion they want, when that is not where the evidence leads. There's an old saying about how it's better a guilty man go free than an innocent man be jailed, and there really is something to that. Dennis Perry spent 20 years behind bars for a, a crime that he did not commit, and because his state doesn't offer compensation for wrongful convictions, he is just out those 20 years, without so much as a penny to even start over with. Those that purposely bent the information to get his conviction are immune from prosecution. That's it for today. Please leave a comment if there is a certain type of video you would like me to cover or a suggestion for a case that hasn't gotten a lot of coverage yet. 
I'm absolutely open to new ideas that might make the channel better. Thank you for watching and listening. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Take care of yourselves and each other.